Good day and welcome to Janama Ransos Weekly Wraps. I'm Viv Govinda and usually what we'll do is we'll go over some macroeconomic stories and then end up with a tech segment at the end. In our macro stories this week, we're going to cover elections, SA and in Europe. And then we're going to also look in the macro segment at uh, inflation in the US as well as the latest from the Fed. In the AI slash tech segment, we look at three things. The latest from Tesla with the regards to the vote. Uh, the latest, uh, you know, WWDC, uh, which is the Worldwide Development Conference from a Apple, and results from Oracle. Okay, starting off with elections. In South Africa, as I speak to you, we are likely to have the first sitting of uh, the Parliament uh, tomorrow, and that's going to be uh, basically, if this is happening, then we know for certain that the uh, coalition deal has been done between the ANC and whoever their partners are going to be, likely to be the DA and the IFP. Uh, this is obviously uh, probably the best deal that the market uh, would be expecting. Uh, I would have said that in terms of uh, possible election outcomes, an ANC-DA coalition would have been better even than the ANC winning outright. And the ANC winning outright was what the market was kind of like you know, hoping for. Uh, this obviously in the, on the um, macro scale looks quite nice, uh, or for the national scale looks quite nice rather. But on the provincial scale, it does bring up uh, a bit of a danger. The danger is... Uh, if these three parties, the IFP, the DA, and the ANC team up together, they basically are overtaking the ANC in KZN. Oh, sorry, the MK in KZN. The MK has gotten 45% of the vote, 37 seats at the moment. Uh, however, if you have the IFP, DA, and ANC combined, that pretty much gets to 40 seats. Uh, 41 is required for majority. Uh, there are two other seats. I believe there's the NFP, which is like a splinter group of the IFP. And then there's a couple seats for uh, the uh, EFF. So there's three seats there. So uh, if those parties go to the um, MK, it's going to be 40-40, a split, uh, you know, a legislature in KZN, which might be a bit of trouble, especially considering some of the violence that's been, you know, uh, common in KZN over the last couple of years. Now, moving on to French elections. Uh, this wasn't a thing last week, but now it is. What happened was, uh, in France, uh, there was European elections held uh, over the last weekend or so, and uh, we had the numbers from a number of different places, from Germany, from Denmark, from all over Europe, basically. They voted for the EU Parliament. And what we saw was a couple of bits of surprises coming through. Um, most uh, notably, we saw uh, the right wing do reasonably well, but not spectacularly so. Uh, this is primarily due to the fact that I think what's happened is the right-wing policies that uh, these parties were created to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, defend or to propose, uh, to a certain extent, has been adopted by the centre. So, most notably, things are against immigration. Now, very few parties in in, in, the, in the European Union are against things like welfare. Even the right-wing parties. It's not like in the US where the right-wing is against welfare and the left-wing is against is, is for welfare. The primary defining f uh, force in Europe is more about immigration. And if you look at uh, some of the moves around immigration, uh, I think it's pretty much uh, a given right now that the European Union is moving more anti-immigration than they were a couple of years ago. And that's kind of taken the steam out, like I said, of these uh, of these right-wing parties. So we saw the AFDP, for example, the Alternative for Deutschland party, which is more right-wing party in, in uh, Germany, do well, but not as well has been anticipated or feared. How you want to look at it? Uh, because, like I said, we are seeing parties that are more to the centre getting more anti-immigration and therefore taking some of that steam out. Uh, Denmark, for instance, we saw a left-wing party do reasonably well again, based on the idea that the left-wing party is now much more anti-immigration than it itself was, you know, a few years ago. So uh, that was the the big uh, takeaway there. The one place that was different was France, where you know, Charles Macron, Emmanuel uh, Macron's party. Uh, much worse than Marine Le Pen's party, which is the more right-wing party there. And Marine Le Pen has been the runner-up in the French elections a couple of times so far. This is the overall national election. And I think um, Macron sees this as a real threat to his overall you know, power. Uh, because in France, what they do is they have an election for the president, and then what happens, they cut everybody out except the top two, and the top two can go and stick together. So it's not going to be a case if you don't make the majority uh, outright in the first round that you just get there by being the number one. You have to have the majority, and therefore they have two rounds of elections usually, unless somebody wins in the first round a majority. Um, so what's the case here? I think he's trying to kind of stifle uh, a possible, uh, you know, victory uh, by the right-wing parties if they're given more time to basically organize for an election uh, by holding an election as quickly as possible. And that's pretty much what he's doing. He's pushed forward the election date, uh, or don't push forward, but 
called an election that's very close to the current time um, in the hope that it actually doesn't give them enough time to have a, um, a, a rally by the, or, 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 or enough time for the opposition to organize itself uh, in order to basically be a threat to him. So let's just see if this works or not. It's a very high risk thing. I think uh, basically calling an election just after you were shown to be rather unpopular with the electorate is, you know, like I said, quite a threat. What he's relying on is the idea that uh, the threat of having Marine Le Pen's party win is going to show up his support. So the French election, I think, is important to look at. Uh, in the English election, just as, a, as an aside, uh, Nigel Farage, who's the guy that drove Brexit, uh, has decided to come back into the election as the head of the uh, Reform Party. Uh, but just a couple of weeks ago, he was saying he wasn't going to be there. And in the latest polls, he's polling very close to the Tories. It's a given that Labour is going to win. It's not like, unless Bari an absolutely massive disaster on their part, and then we would require a scandal of quite epic proportions for them not to win. Um, Labour's going to win the next election. But um, Farage's party is coming quite close to the Tory party, and it's going to also pose a real threat. Um, I don't think it'll be the opposition, but it's not that far away from it. Uh, it's first past the post in, in, uh, in uh, the UK, so uh, often you'll find a party even with like large... Uh, you know, numbers not having any seats or many, many seats as you would think uh, in the overall, um, you know, it was uh, parliament just because of the fact that even though it has large spot, none of the spot is in any particular area high enough to actually win the, the first past the post uh, election. So that's one thing to be looked at. Okay, moving on to interest rates. So we've had some, uh, you know, the FOC meeting this uh, week from the US, plus we've had uh, a couple of inflation figures, CPI and PPI. The CPI number came in better than expected, the point one lower than than anticipated. Um, you know, three point four versus three point three, which is the actual number. Three point four was expected, three point three we came through. Um, then we also had the PPI number come out as well the day after. The PPI number was significantly better than expected by about point three. Uh, you know, virtually showing um, a significant drop off in producer price inflation. Now, why is this important? Because the U.S. Fed is looking at cutting interest rates this year. In fact, the FOMC meeting talked about cutting the rates in uh, December. Now, if you think about it, the Fed probably wants to cut rates more than not, if you know what I mean. Its incentive is to cut rates earlier and as much as possible. Unfortunately, it can't do that without damaging its credibility unless we see inflation come down significantly. And so what we've been seeing right now is a situation in which the Fed basically has been reasonably cautious about how, to, you know, how it's going about cutting rates, talking about getting it lower to, or inflation closer to the 2% target, showing significant trend lines towards 2% um, before it decides to cut. And in the last meeting, like I said this week, uh, it's talked about the fact that it's going to have one rate cut this year, and that one rate cut is going to be in December. But if we see the surprise come through the CPI, which was slightly before the Fed uh, spoke, and then we see this bigger surprise after the Fed spoke with the PPI, I would think that the chance of a rate cut in the market's expectations anyway have gone higher, uh, which would mean in, for our terms as South Africans, you know, we're talking about the election, uh, DA, uh, coalition with the ANC, and we talk about the US Fed cutting more than expected, expect strength coming too in the currency. Now moving on to our AI slash tech segment. We have a couple of things to look at here. Firstly, with regards to Tesla just getting out of the way, it seems that the vote has gone in favor of Elon Musk. Now, this does not mean he's, uh, this thing is over. Uh, there's going to be a couple of options available to us here. Firstly, uh, the judge has ruled that the uh, initial payment package is null and void and there needs to be some remedies. The reason that they ruled null and void was because the pay package uh, was basically given to uh, the, the voting of the shareholders um, without full knowledge for the shareholders. That's not, you can't argue that now. I mean, it's pretty well established that the shareholders know what they're voting for right now. Uh, the next question is, what is the judge going to do? There's three options she has. Firstly, she can accept it, and then in more likelihood, there still will be a, an appeal, but the appeal won't be on behalf of Elon Musk, it'll be on behalf of the plaintiffs in the case, uh, that the lawyer and the guy with nine shares that basically brought the case up in the first place to the uh, to go to the higher court in Delaware. The second thing is she could refuse it and then Elon Musk will be appealing, but now he's going to be appealing, uh, showing the higher court, hey, not only did these guys vote in the first place for it, because the judge says they didn't have the right uh, information, now they definitely have the right information and they voted for it again. Do you really want to overturn two votes by uh, these shareholders? 
And the third thing is that she could order a kind of a retrial, say, I need more information and therefore, uh, you know, do uh, this whole process again. Uh, I don't know what is the outcome going to be, but it must be noted that this particular judge has in the past been pretty negative around uh, Musk, and therefore there might be an internal bias on her part to go against him again. Let's just see what happens. Uh, next, we had Apple's, uh, it was uh, WWDC come out. Uh, the important part here, again, uh, we're going to talk about Musk again, um, was the linking with OpenAI for uh, to AI services on um, on iPhones and Apple machines, etc. Now, Musk has come out and said that uh, this is basically giving away or selling you down the river to OpenAI because OpenAI is going to steal your data and use it for nefarious purposes. I personally have looked at this and I don't think that is true. Uh, Apple uh, has a reputation for you know, security, uh, data security for its users, and they have not changed for this particular thing. I think if you just look at uh, what they are doing, this is about as much as you can hope for, to have access to AI and have security. So what they're doing is they're saying, you basically send your data over, if you have to send data over, to Apple's secure cloud, and it's going to have a personal secure server for you, and it's going to be encrypted, and they're not going to have access to the server. If they can't answer the questions that you have, they may decide to send it over to OpenAI, but you have to approve of that first of all. And OpenAI is going to also have some security measures to not use your data for other things. Now, why is this important? Because if they do use your data for training the model, let's just say you have a company making widgets, okay? And you have a special way of making the widgets. There's some kind of uh, you know, special add, you know, salt in a certain process to make the widget, uh, to, uh, to basically make this thing better off for you. Now, if you basically are going to be in a situation where you want to have this extra bit of information and have it protected, if this information is sent over to OpenAI and used to train their models, what you will find is that uh, these models are going to be having that knowledge in them for future questions. So let's just say somebody from widget company B that also makes these widgets asks, what's the best way to make this widget? The information about adding salt at this particular point in the process will be in that uh, data set that this thing was trained on. And so it could answer how to make this widget and will tell you how to do it using this, this particular extra step. So that is the danger of having or using these things, even if your data is anonymized, the information it learns becomes part of its brain in a, in a way. And if it is asked a question the right way in the future, it can answer that. I mean, um, there's examples here where you can ask this thing how to make napalm, and it'll give you an example. Ask it how to make certain kinds of you know uh, poison gas, and it will tell you how to do that, unless there's significant uh, you know training done to tell you not to do that. If you are using uh, this particular uh, you know um, AI to ask questions about your company, and you are seeing data in, or ask questions about whatever data you have, and that, some of that data includes some of your trade secrets, etc., from your company, and that data is used then by OpenAI to train its models, those models will internally have that information in their brains, you know, vertical cover brains, and allow it to answer questions in the future that may give away some of your trade secrets. So that is the danger. That being said, I don't think that Apple is in any, um, if you are going to be using AI in any way, I'd probably say the Apple system is probably the most trustworthy for a retail investor, a retail sort of user, sort of another, a retail user to use, as opposed to pretty much any other kind of AI uh, system out there. Because Apple, like I said, has a history, has a power, and has taken measures to make sure that your data is protected. Okay, and then finally, uh, looking at Oracle. Oracle's results uh, came out this week, and this is not going to go into much detail. Oracle, for those that don't know, is a database company, a uh, cloud systems company. Um, they basically, if you want to have a database for a really large organization, you get Oracle in and they do it for you. Um, and they do clouds as well, uh, you know, computing, etc. for uh, these bigger corporations out there. Now, uh, the results came out, earnings were terrible, were worse than expected, so they missed on earnings. And yet the stock went up like 13, 14%. Why? AI again. They talk about future usages being, uh, you know, uh, quite high, uh, or they talk about future revenue being quite high, and they talk about a link up with both Google and OpenAI when it comes to AI for Oracle. Now, in all the use cases out there for that I can see that are really being monetized at a really high level and giving you a lot of revenue, I think Oracle is best place to actually get uh, a huge amount of benefit from AI for its users because can you imagine having the entire information of your company, which is in its database, effectively. And ha as a CEO, having an AI that can basically ask, you can ask questions about it. Hey, what was the biggest thing we spent money on last year? What is the biggest difference in terms of money spent last year versus this year? What, I, what category was it? Which division was it coming from? Who was authorizing this stuff? 
if you had an AI system operating on your database, that could answer those questions. If it had the information on your receipts and invoices and so on, you could ask, what was the greatest jump up in revenue? Which salesperson is like basically having the biggest change? It can ask, answer that kind of questions. And I can imagine that in terms of the usefulness of a database, it becomes multiple times more useful if you have that access to that AI. And so the Oracle, like I said, up like 13, 14%. And just as an aside, I mean, I just had my AI seminar last week. And if you looked at it, um, it's on YouTube, you can go back and look at it. Uh, two of our laggards had been uh, Oracle and uh, Apple. And had I done them this week, they would both be up in excess of 10% from where we were seeing them last week. So they will no longer be laggards. They'll be middle of the field for the, the portfolio. Okay, that's it for this week. Thanks for joining me. And I look forward to speaking to you guys again next week. Cheers.